Oh, that is awesome. Well, I don't have any extra questions. Um, anybody has any questions right now for Huggy, go ahead and post them. And let's see what we've got here. Here we go. A question for you there, Huggy. Sir, when you flew a mission, how did you know you were photographing the correct location as long as that information isn't classified? It's a good question. I can tell you, but I have to kill you. No, the, the uh, you know, when you're with the camera, you know, we've got a, uh, you know, we know the targets in advance. And so we're, we're on the navigation system and we're, and we're just navigating over the targets doing our thing. Is it shooting, um, I mean, shoot straight uh, angle? Or you have to pay. Angle we have now is, is a, it shoots a kind of a wide pattern, you know, really, really high accuracy. You know, further out, you get a little bit less, but we just, we fly right over the, uh, you know, right over the area. And there's a certain tolerance we have, which I can't get into, but we'll fly over the area, but we don't fly that much wet film anymore. And let me pause. Uh, opening day of Desert Storm, I got to fly opening day of Desert Storm. We had a, uh, a camera called the H camera, super long focal length, and we could slew that camera over. It, that was the old, hey, you know, let's, you know, is he smoking Marlboros or is he smoking, you know, Lucky Strikes, you know, that kind of thing. So really, we can slow that, slew that camera over there and take a look, but we don't have that camera anymore. But what we have now with the, uh, the, the, the sensor of choice, the imagery of choice, in my opinion, is the synthetic aperture radar because uh -huh. day, night, weather, it doesn't matter. And it's getting better and better. It takes some really great shots. So they can, we can, we can fly on the track and they can slew the radar and do anything they want with it. So we can be anywhere within the radar's range and they can, they being the folks that are on the data link with us that control the sensor, they can make it do what it needs to do. Oh, nice. Any record of incentive flights? Would love to backseat. <laughs> sure, that's a long shot. Thanks for the interview, Stefan. There we go. Stefan, I, I, all, all I can say is get in line, my friend. I think you're right behind Taco on this one. So uh, yeah, man, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be definitely like uh, Sergeant Armstrong uh, years ago. That seat's mine. I'm in the back of that <laughs> son of a gun. That's gonna be mine. We use the T38 for most of our incentive flights, but I've done um, I've done at least two I can think of. One was it was one was an 06, and uh, oh, I flew a uh, Snake Clark in the Pentagon. Who's he was Snake a character, Clark? yeah, a big character. I, I'll get into him. He's a he's a he's a big a big wig at the Pentagon, uh, and then um, I flew one of our crew chiefs, the crew chief of the year, a guy named Sean uh -huh. Lewis back in '97. Now he's a he's a big uh, he's a big Lockheed maintenance guy. Uh, so he was he was the top maintenance guy in back in '97 or '98 at Beale and. Flew him in the YouTube. Yes, we don't do very much. Very, very rare, but it does happen. Well, any any little vignette stories you wanted to tell before uh, we we oh, we crank man. it for um, the night? Any any funny things that happened to you that you just you know? I, 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 people may have heard the story if they see me speak, but I got to tell you, a really funny story was um, this is nineteen ninety one. Nineteen ninety one. I'm in England, and uh, I mentioned the guy John Roush. He was the tweet. IP that told me about the YouTube program. John went to England and then I went to England about a year after him. So we were out there and we went to, uh, I'd been in England about a year and a half and uh, we went over to, is after the, right after the Gulf War is over. And in September of that 91, we went over to RF Lucas. It's uh, right by St. Andrews where golf was invented. I'm not a golfer, but big deal. And they had a couple of tornado squadrons and an F4 squadron at the time. And, and we went over to the big air show there. Big, big, big. The Brits do an air show like nobody else. It's in the Canadians. Right. They do a fantastic job. And drink on the flight line. Yeah, oh, yeah. They're, they're, well, they drink <laughs> everywhere. Those guys drink everywhere. And so uh, uh, John flew the aircraft in uh, from Alcantara. It wasn't a long flight, but he flew in the spacesuit. So, and this was the wall had come down, and this was going to be the first visit uh, of the Russians to the West in the in their demonstration team oh, called wow. the Russian Knights, flying a five ship or a six ship of uh, Su 27s. So uh, John flies in, lands on the ramp, and, uh, you know, he's in the spacesuit. And we're standing by the aircraft. It's the Friday, you know, the Friday before everything happens, you know. And there's crowds everywhere, and there's Russian people, British Army everywhere. It's a great time. And then all of a sudden, you, here they come up initially, the ninth ship of the, the Red Arrows, you know, right to come up initial right at you. And right behind them, the five Su-27s of the Russians. And they, you know, big arrival show, breakout, jets everywhere, noise. It's glorious, you know. We're watching the whole thing. It's pretty cool. And uh, How many crash? No one crash. <laughs> They come in and land, and uh, we're standing by the aircraft, and uh, one of these uh, Russian guys comes over, a Russian general comes over, and he's you know he's got the the full great coat, the hat that's like two two acres of hat on there, right? And uh, comes over with a British Army translator, and hey, Comrade Smirnov would like to see the famous uh, Lockheed U two. I look at John, he's senior to me, he looks at me, I'm like, yeah, I guess you know. So. Uh, uh, you know, so we we got the we got we got a camera. You know, we got a we now we have no we have no sense on the aircraft. We just have a basic right. aircraft. 
but we got the we got the uh, we got the ladder going up to the cockpit. You you can put three or four people on the platform. Uh, comrade Smirnoff would like to go up and take a look at the uh, up at the top. So yeah, the guy looks at me. So he, he walks up there with the translator. You got the we, original with Francis Gary Powers. <laughs> we we should have known. We should have known. Yeah. So we walk up there and we're look we're looking around. And we do do that. We do that. We do do that. Oh, yeah, comrade you know, Smirnoff would, like would like to know if you could open the cockpit and take a look inside. Yeah, sure. Why not? You know. So we open the cockpit. He's looking in. <laughs> what do you know? What do you know? What do you know? What do you know? Comrade uh, General uh, Smirnoff would like to know if he can get inside the cockpit. John looks at me. I look at him. Sure, go ahead. So, no oh, oh, what is it? What is it? Oh, oh, so he kind of lowers himself into the cockpit, you know, gets in and gets settled in. And he's kind of sitting around, looking, the, looking around, and he kind of looks at the translator. And goes, oh, now let me just pause right there and go back and say, John spent his teenage years. His dad worked in the Rush in the Russian embassy in Moscow. John, <laughs> John's listening to the whole thing back and forth. So <laughs> all I hear is the general go to the British to the army, his escort, the army, army, British Army translator. And before I can hear anything back, John looks at me and goes, the Russian general gets this look on his face, looks at John, goes, <laughs> and John goes, and John goes <laughs> Gets up out of the cockpit and storms up the stairs of the British Army. Oh, it's so, you know, <laughs> chasing him out. And John is sitting at the top of the, the, the ladder just going. <laughs> I'm like, no way. What did you do? He goes, ah, he goes, he got in the cockpit. He looked around. He goes, you know, this does not look that impressive. This is pretty old stuff in here. And, uh, <laughs> and when he looked up at the translator, uh, John said, yes, sir, but all of the important equipment is state of the art and in the pods. And he said, the general looked at him and went, you speak Russian? And John goes, yes, sir, of course. All you two pilots speak Russian. So the ultimate coup, it was, it, was, it was a great time. And, of course, we had our big rage fest at the club that night, the British club. But, yeah, that was awesome uh, disinformation. Was he's going back. <laughs> First thing, he's back there right now typing back, beware. All, <laughs> all American U2 SR-71 pilots are trained to speak Russian. That's Rutsky. <laughs> You ask Rich Graham, I bet he speaks Russian. I don't know. <laughs> we, had, we had a great time uh, drinking vodka with the Russian uh, SU twenty, the Russian night team in the uh, in the bar that night. It was it was it was it was a, it was a hell of a weekend. Well, you know, I'm in the armor, and uh, my buddy John Wilkinson is staying up late right now over in the UK watching this. Uh, as you can see, hi, as a youngster, I live in RAF lectures. Is that how you pronounce Luthers. it? Lukers. That's amazing to know that you'd been there. I had no knowledge of aviation being an ex-armor uh, recce guy. My question is, on average, what would the length of your average sortie be? Uh, back in the UK, they were uh, eight eight or nine hour missions. But uh, uh, yeah, they, they've gotten a little lengthy for the Middle East missions. And we, like I said, we've seen uh, nine to a 12 hour missions, depending on it. We don't like to go really, we don't like to extend that long. You know, you start to make errors and mistakes when you're by yourself doing that. Sure. So. Right what do you up. do? Do you do air to air refueling with a KC-135 or no? You no, guys are all internal. Yeah, we we uh, we can, if we put a tank a full tank of gas on the aircraft, we can fly. Uh, we could probably fly 15, 16 hours and have a little bit of reserve. So it's it's not That's amazing. You're, you're out of physiological. Yeah, you're out of physiological time. But since um, well, go yeah. ahead, go ahead. No, no, a, a, the same trip. My, uh, since he mentioned he was at Lukers, John was coming into Lukers on that Friday. You know, um, and of course. The field around Lukers is just packed. And then you know how the Brits are. They are airplane nuts. Up in Scotland, right. they're airplane crazy. There are thousands of people around the perimeter fence. And uh, John's coming on the straight. And you can see the landing light out there, you know, the big U2 wingspan coming on in. I'm on the radio in the car. And they've all got scanners. They're all listening to everything we say. Uh -huh. And his call sign was Rook 28 or Rook, Rook something with a Rook call sign. And I'm called the mobile. I go, uh, Rook 28, mobile? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, check that your satellite refueling door is closed. <laughs> and, I, yeah, it's closed. and that was all we said. And this eruption, I could see from around the fence, like they had just gotten the scoop of the century, <laughs> you know. And you know, and then over the weekend, a couple of people walk up. Hey, so the satellite refueling door. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. Right, right, right. You know, off they go. Like they, you know, we had just we had, we had let the big secret out of the bag. You know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Man, that's an that aviation was, week technology. Oh. The very following week. 
I yeah, was over in England. I was over with the U-2 spy plane landed. And I have to tell you that the satellite refueling door was left open. I'm very <laughs> terribly sorry. My name is Nigel. <laughs> you know, my three and a half years of flying U-2 in England, that was the that was the best three and a half years of my entire 28 years in the military. That was yeah. it was an exceptional place to be flying them. And the people were wonderful. We made some great friends. And I, uh, I, I, I was disappointed, very disappointed I had to have to leave. But uh, yeah, it, it, it always happens. I get you, man. When I flew the triple seven, I would fly over or triple seven, seven, eight. Um, and my British army buddies would come pick me up. Keith Banfield and uh, Kevin Brown. Uh, these guys would come to the hotel. Keith shows up or Kevin shows up in his Mark one ferret, which is an armored scout car. And he pulls into the taxi stand. There's two taxi tan stand spots. Right. And he pulls in, he parks because it's very limited parking. Yeah. And he gets out. And we're all giving bigger bear hugs and whatnot. And this taxi pulls in. And the guy goes, um, oi, move that piece of shit, oi. And, and Kevin turns around and goes, if you don't like it, push it out of the way, mate. And he <laughs> gives him one of those. And I was like, this is a way Seven to start tons. this. Yeah. yeah, man, it was great. We drove all over London with this armored scout car with a machine gun up in the, in the turret and the whole nine yards. There were more pictures of us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, you know, oh, than the it. London Tower that day. We had more fun. That's really neat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I love I love going over there and visiting those guys, and yeah, I miss that. Yeah. So one day, one day, do you ever one get day. to go back and go visit your buddies over there? I haven't been back to England in uh, six years. Right before I retired in fourteen, I, I I flew a jet out of England in uh, January of uh, fourteen. For any of the aviation buffs on there, you probably saw the picture of the airplane. It said Chris Pocock is in here, written on the side of the aircraft on the equipment bay. But if you saw that picture, that was me flying the aircraft out. We had a lot of fun with the British. Uh, the photographers that around the field, you know, I was on the way to fly the plane. We stopped and got out, went and talked to him. And uh, what well, was, was who's Chris Pocock? Who's Chris? He's the guy I mentioned earlier. He's the British uh, <clears throat> aviation journalist and historian. Ah. Uh, he's got the Dragon Lady Today website, and uh, uh, just uh, he's got more history in you two. Uh, he's a, he's a, he's a wonderful, wonderful uh, resource and a person uh, to know uh, to learn everything about the U two. You can has a, has some really good books on the U two out there. They're very accurate. Probably, probably a little too accurate. If I'd have written them, I'd be in jail, but Chris can get away with it. <laughs> and he's probably talked to enough guys. He's got enough firsthand stories. He could tell yeah. vignettes as, as if he lived it. Yeah, he, uh, yeah he's he been doing it a long time. I, I met Chris back in probably 91 or 92 in England when he was snooping around the squadron getting getting data. Yeah. You know what? You have to do intro for me, and we could do a uh, podcast with him, bring him on the show. I'll, I'm certainly happy to, happy to introduce you to.